All right, welcome to our final lesson over fingerprints. This is lesson three, and we have talked about the different types of fingerprints. We have talked about minutia patterns. We have talked about how investigators use prints to their advantage when working a crime scene. Uh, and today we're going to talk about how to make prints visible or how crime scene investigators make prints visible that are found at a crime scene. So just to recap, fingerprint uh, analysts are tasked with a difficult job. They have to physically analyze prints and they have to find minutia patterns that are in common between suspect prints and evidence prints found at a crime scene. Um, you might have come to this class thinking that um, it was really easy to work a crime scene and collect fingerprints, and then it's even easier if you have a suspect to compare those prints. But hopefully um, throughout the lessons and the activities that we've been doing and the case studies we've been looking at, you know that it's quite a challenging job for these fingerprint analysts. They do look for points of comparison in common and we call these points of comparison minutia patterns. These are specific patterns that fingerprint analysts look for when they're doing these comparisons. We also learned in the last lesson that there's not a set number of minutia patterns that have to be in common before a match is declared, but usually eight to 16 are declared before a match is confirmed. Um, and then these fingerprint analysts will be asked to testify to the percent of confidence they have in their comparison and in their match declaration uh, when they do get to court. Uh, if you were with us in the last lesson, I asked you to research the Brandon Mayfield case uh, and you were to watch, you were supposed to watch PBS's Frontline, The Real CSI. And I hope you found that interesting. That whole program is really interesting um, in understanding how forensic investigators really work. It is not like we see on CSI. We learned that. Um, and then specifically, that Brandon Mayfield case has called into question the use of fingerprint identification within forensics. And so maybe it called you to question that as well. All right, so for today's lesson, you need to know that there are three types of crime scene prints. Now don't get this confused with the three patterns. So the three patterns of fingerprints are loops, whirls, and arches. But if we're working a crime scene, there are three types of fingerprints that we could find at a crime scene. So the first is visible prints. These prints are made by fingers that touch a surface and then the ridges have been in contact with some sort of colored or visible material like blood or dirt or paint, ink, um, makeup. I know a lot of times I get makeup on my fingertips and if I touch a white sheet of paper or a white wall, I'll leave fingerprints behind because my makeup uh, mixes with the oils on my, my ridge patterns. So visible prints are prints that are seen by investigators when they are scanning the crime scene. You can also have plastic prints and that is synonymous with what some investigators call impression prints. So plastic and impression prints are prints that are three-dimensional. They are ridge impressions that are left in pliable material or a soft material like putty or wax, soap, um, dust, and these are also visible prints for the most part. Um, and then you have what's called latent prints, and latent prints are invisible prints that are left behind by clear oils on the finger. Uh, fingertips. If you look around you, I'm not sure where you are right now, but if you look around you, it is very likely that there are hundreds of fingerprints all around you on desk or books or walls. And if you can't see them, then that means they are latent prints. Now, if you're looking around and you see a fingerprint on a desk, uh, then that would be a visible print. But more than likely, the fingerprints that are around you are latent or not visible to the naked eye. So investigators, when they are locating visible or plastic prints at a crime scene, they normally don't have a problem uh, finding these prints because they are visible. However, latent prints are a little more difficult because they're invisible prints and they have to be made visible by investigators. 
Now, this has been helpful in the past few years because there have been many advances in fingerprint technology that have made it a little easier for investigators to find these latent prints. So there are a plethora of uh, tools and powders and chemicals that are used by investigators. And one of those new technologies um, is an ultraviolet image converter. And it helps to detect latent fingerprints um, by using ultraviolet images. So this device is called the RUVIS. And that, is, that stands for Reflected Ultraviolet Imaging System. But the RUVIS can locate prints on most non-absorbent surfaces without using chemicals or powders like investigators traditionally used. So you can see here the RUVIS um, is like a cross between a microscope, camera, um, and you can see from the image on the right, it produces a, an ultraviolet um, capture of the fingerprint. And so this is a newer technology that's being used and it helps investigators um, because they're not having to breathe in all those powders and chemicals. It's a lot safer and a lot more effective. Now fingerprints um, can also be made visible with powders. This is like the more traditional method of um, making prints visible. So these fingerprint powders um, they come in a plethora of different uh, colors and styles and compositions. They can be applied using different brushes and wands. But experienced examiners find that gray and black powders are most adequate for uh, producing those nice, crisp, latent fingerprints. Now, of course, if you're dusting on a darker surface, you would not want to use a black powder. Um, you might would use, there are neon powders, there are white powders. So uh, investigators have sort of an arsenal of different chemicals and powders and technologies at their disposal when they're working a crime scene. So when using powders, investigators have to be extra careful not to destroy, destroy the print because they're physically dusting the powder over the fingerprint. So there's definitely a technique to this. It is an art. If you have ever tried to dust for a fingerprint, you know that it is not as easy as it looks. It's actually really difficult to, one, find a print, two, dust for the print, Three, lift the print so that you capture all the minutia patterns. So definitely is an art form. Uh, in addition to powders, chemicals are used to collect or make prints visible. Um, one example is iodine fuming. Another is a chemical called ninhydrin. It's often used. Um, ninhydrin is a chemical powder that reacts with amino acids that are present in fingerprint residue. And that powder is oftentimes converted to a liquid so that it can be sprayed. Um, but ninhydrin is a chemical that uses chemical reactions to make prints visible. Another example of that would be superglue fuming. Um, so the main ingredient in superglue is a chemical called cyanoacrylate. And cyanoacrylate also attracts to the amino acids. Additionally, it attracts to the fatty acids and the proteins in a fingerprint. And because of this reaction, it um, produces a nice fingerprint for a lot of investigators if the conditions are right. So a lot of different ways to collect prints, a lot of different ways to make prints visible at a crime scene if they are latent prints. Now, once fingerprints are identified and collected, they're run against a digital program and stored in a digital program called APHIS, which is short for the Automated Fingerprint Identification System. Now, at the current time, APHIS contains about 50 million fingerprint records, which is a lot of fingerprint records. Um, but this computer system has the ability to scan and then digitally encode fingerprints so that they can be subject to high-speed computer processing. So a lot of these minutia patterns can be detected um, using computer software. And the way it works is a fingerprint's converted into like a digital minutia and then an algorithm sort of reads the fingerprint 
and identifies matches between minutia patterns found in one fingerprint and another. And so we can see in this example, you can see at the bottom, um, this particular, these two fingerprints, there were 24 minutia patterns in common. And so this, um, the algorithm of the computer program um, has a matching score of 100%. So this computer program identifies both of these prints as um, originating, originating from the same person. Excuse me, it was hard to get my words out. All right, so that ends our fingerprint lesson, and we are done for the day. I will see you in the next lesson.